Okay, we are continuing the operation of the Holy Spirit. We're presently looking at regeneration, and we have started to understand uh, from John 3, 1 through 17, the very teaching, preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. So is everyone who is born from the Spirit. And that is entered into by look and live, believe. Born again from life from above. And this is an operation that the Holy Spirit does with the believer. And it is based on the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. He's the one that would be lifted up. And when we look and live, um, we, we are those that become verse 15 of John chapter 3 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we now move to the book of Titus chapter 3. The book of Titus chapter 3. And we're going to begin in verse 4. Uh, and it reads, But after the kindness... And love of God our Savior toward man appeared. That word appeared is epiphaneo. It's personal. It's individual. Um, it's, it's, it is a physical appearing. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, his piteousness, his pardon. He saved us, delivered us from sin by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Notice, it is by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is a spiritual operation that the Holy Spirit accomplishes, which he shed on us abundantly. What did he shed on us abundantly? His mercy, his mercy, his piteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being judicially declared righteous, justified by his unmerited, unrecompensable favor, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Now, we'll be looking at that later when we look at the adoption of the believer. Um, now, let's move to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Born from above. So we see this in the teaching of Jesus Christ. We see this in the teaching of of the Apostle Paul in the book of Titus. We now see it in the teaching of Peter in his first epistle. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Election is God's sovereign, gracious choosing from the foundation of the world. And this foreknowledge is simply God foreknew. Them he foreknew, them he also predestinated. And them he predestinated to be more conformed to the image of his Son. And those that he has predestinated, no more, no less, them he also justified. No more, no less. And them he justified, them he also glorified. No more, no less. Now, let's look further, please, in verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love with which he loved us, by grace are ye saved, hath begotten us again, and that is our word, born from above. He has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who? Not only are we saved, we are kept. Who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So begotten from above, begotten again. Now this is uh, this subject is taken back up at the end of this chapter, and in the book of First Peter chapter one verse twenty-two, seeing that ye purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, by the word of God, who liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is like grass, and the glory of man like the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So as we're looking at these passages, we do understand um, that, that we are those who are begotten again, born again through the incorruptible word of God. All right, uh, we end where we started in the Gospel of John. And I do apologize for the background noise. Uh, and uh, we only had a few days to do this, so I'm afraid that we're going to have to put up with that background noise. Hopefully you can uh, compartmentalize that. Now John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him, that is the light, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true light, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. So uh, we see that we're born from above, born of God. So um, we continue then, uh, to our next, um, our, our, uh, we continue now with the operations of the Holy Spirit. While we're in John, to make a smooth transition, we're going to look at the fact of baptism of the Spirit. This baptism of the Spirit has nothing to do with the ritual baptism that we're so familiar with. Ritual baptism does not save anyone. And let's understand that, please. And the baptism of the Spirit, just as with regeneration, is a spiritual undertaking. It means immersed into Jesus Christ, His church, and the death, burial, and resurrection um, of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the purpose of His coming to the earth. Now, as we're looking at these pages, by the way, you need to be writing down these notes and passages for yourself so that you can um, re-study it and come to know it and see it yourself. Now, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, we have the forerunner, John the Baptist, and he is introducing Jesus Christ. And look in John, chapter 1, and in verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. May I make it clear that this was a revolutionary statement. It was a revolutionary statement. There had never been the expiation of sin. It was always that which was uh, atoned for, covered under the law. Here is presented not just the Lamb of Sacrifice, but the Lamb of God. It took God to take the sin of the world away. And notice it wasn't just Israel. 
It does not say, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of Israel, although that's true. It was the sin of the world. This is God's Lamb to take away the sin of the whole world. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's the propitiation, the mercy seat for sin of the whole world. Now, in verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh the man who's preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. That's not unusual for an Old Testament prophet. We already read in the book of 1 Peter how that they wrote the things that the Holy Spirit directed them to write and then searched the scriptures diligently to see what those things meant. Now notice, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. This is one of the many purposes of the baptism of Jesus Christ. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance as made clear in Luke chapter 4. And certainly Jesus Christ did not need to repent of anything. He is the, he's the son of God as declared here in the gospel of John. So what we have then is that this baptism also served the purpose of, of the uh, appearance and of the declaration of the Messiah to Israel. Now, therefore, am I come baptizing with water? And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Now, this is one of those scenes in Scripture where we have the Trinity present. We know from other accounts there was the voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am, I am well pleased. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And we have Jesus Christ, of course, presented here at this baptism. And notice, if you will, and I knew him not. That's reiterated for our, for our benefit. But he that sent me to baptize with water, notice the forerunner was sent by Jesus Christ. Yet, biologically, not possible, but explained in verse 30. This is the one who was before, uh, this is the one that was preferred before me. And so now notice, if you will, please. The same, and that's a theme throughout the book of John, the same, and that is reiterated in Acts, this same Jesus. And we have that in chapter 1, verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God, processionally, constantly with God. Now, please notice, if you will, please, further here in verse 33. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he who baptizes, immerses into, never taken out of, with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that baptizes the believer into Jesus Christ. He is baptized into the church. He is baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may I say that this introduction of Jesus holds true consistently throughout Scripture. If you'll notice in the book, in the book of Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts chapter 1, and you will see that the disciples were to tarry for this baptism. And it is re reiterated here. Look in Acts chapter 1, please, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
And notice down in verse 8, And ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the othermost parts of the earth. So you see the program of God concerning the Holy Spirit. He is to baptize them, these apostles, into uh, the body of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost, which we'll talk about later. Now, notice he also is going to give them power to be his witnesses. And how important that, um, that is to us even today. That great commission has not changed. We're to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're to, we're to mentor disciples, uh, teaching them the things that you've observed. And lo, I'm with you always. My friends, uh, we're still in that program today. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 11, and may I say you really need to do some work here on your own. Please write down that you need to read and study Acts 10 and 11 concerning Cornelius' house. How that God... Um, was now taking away that difference between Jew Gentile and opening the door to the Gentile to be saved. And Peter and his six friends from Jerusalem would go to Cornelius' house, and he was as Greek as they came. He was an Italian centurion, and he would not only go to the house but stay and eat there, and you just didn't do that with Gentiles. And God was opening the door to the Gentile. In chapter 10, verse 44, While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. And they of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you can see that they are astonished. They're not jumping up and down and screaming and yelling and babbling. That's not so. They were astonished. Just like on the day of Pentecost, those devout Jews marveled. They marveled at what they saw. And notice, if you will, in verse 46 of chapter 10 of Acts, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Now notice, he's already declared they've received the Holy Spirit. So ritual baptism has nothing to do with receiving the Holy Spirit. Now verse 48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then asked they him to tarry certain days. Now, if you'll notice in chapter 11 and in verse 15, well, I'm going to back up to verse 14. Chapter 11, verse 14. Who shall tell thee words by which thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, this is Peter's testimony explaining to the Jerusalem council what had happened there um, in Cornelius' house. As on us... And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. What us? What beginning? That day of Pentecost, when um, the Holy Spirit baptized them into the church and into the body of Christ and into his gospel. And this idea of speaking in tongues again, as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 14, is a sign to the unbelieving Jew. We see that Peter and the six brethren that came with him were not speaking in tongues. It was the Gentiles who heard the word that were. Now notice further, if you will. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
For as much then as God gave the same gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And that is where the emphasis ought to fall. Both on the day of Pentecost and this day here, it is the gospel. And the tongues was a sign indicating. And in the Pentecost, it was indicating, pointing to Jesus Christ and him crucified. As the book of 1 Corinthians says, some demand a sign, but we preach Christ crucified. Now, I'd like to move on to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, this uh, section of Romans is dealing with imputed righteousness, justification in chapter 5, and moves on into sanctification, glorification from 6 through 8. It is about the just shall live by faith. It is the theme of the gospel of God's grace. That was being challenged. And there were those who were saying, well, Paul is preaching licentiousness because you can keep on sinning and you're still saved. And Paul is answering that objection. And this also has to do with the inherent sin nature. That nature from Adam passed down to all of our fathers to us. And also concerning the Roman lifestyle of licentiousness. Uh, that we must yield our members as instruments of righteousness and uh, holiness unto God. Now, in chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember how chapter 5 ends. Where grace, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And it says here, Paul wants us to understand God forbid, that means far be the thought. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know ye not, God does not want ignorant Christians. Know ye not that as many of us as were immersed into Jesus Christ. May I say that it troubles me when people use this section of Scripture concerning ritual baptism there's not a speck of water in here this is immersion spiritually into jesus christ we're baptized into his death immersion into his death burial and resurrection the gospel of god's grace the theme of the book and notice therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised up from the dead to the glory of, of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And may I say that's how we walk in newness of life. It certainly is not through ritual baptism. It certainly is not in some movement or some work or gift of speaking in tongues. It is not by membership in some church or institution. It is accomplished uh, through the spiritual baptism of Jesus Christ. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. It's what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We have been co-crucified with him. We have been co-buried that we might have the power to mortify uh, sin in the flesh. We've been co-crucified 
that we might live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Now notice, knowing this, that our old man, the old nature, the inherent sin nature, is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and that he liveth, he liveth unto God. You can see, my friends, uh, the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, then I, I label this next section, Paul meets Roy in Rome. Um, Roy is reckon, obey, and yield. Roy. And we are to reckon um, uh, ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. We're to be those that obey. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in its lust. We're to yield. Neither yield ye, give way your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But give way yourselves, yield unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This power to do so comes from the fact that we are immersed into Jesus Christ, his church, his gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. I would like us now for a moment to turn to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians is declaring the preeminence of Jesus Christ. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. He is above all things as the sovereign God. And he is not to be made lower than angels, or just the head of principality and power. Now this is a preemptive strike, this epistle, because we know the Colossians were in good order. They were rooted and built up. They were those that had a steadfastness of faith in Christ. Now in the midst of this, a mystery is made known to us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We turn now to chapter 2, verse 9. I better back up to verse 8. I think that's worthy of our minute. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I say amen. Beware, beware. Those who would beguile you with enticing words, verse 4 says. And this I say, lest any man beguile you with enticing words. Hold this blessed gospel, my friends. You are complete in Jesus Christ in the Godhead bodily. And Colossians 2 verse 9 now comes. For in him, that's Christ, dwelleth tabernacles, all the completeness, fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. That's what this baptism of the Spirit has accomplished. You're complete in Jesus Christ, who is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, Paul uses an ironic uh, contrast. He's saying not the circumcision made with hands, not proselytism under the law, but rather the circumcision of the uh, crucifixion of the flesh in Jesus Christ in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In verse 12, co-burial, Buried with him in baptism, in which also he arisen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It is not the operation, it's certainly not the hands of men, 
and it's certainly not the working of men either, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath transformed alive together with him, for having forgiven you all trespasses. My friends, you've been made complete in the Godhead bodily. You have been co-death, co-burial, co-resurrected in the preeminent head of the church, Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In chapter 1 and in verse 26, well, verse 25, of which I made a minister according to the dispensation, that is, stewardship of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hidden from ages and from generation, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Please turn to the book of Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 1. Since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. This book of Colossians lifts up our eyes through the co-resurrection of Jesus Christ. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, co-death. When Christ, our life, shall appear, then shall, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, co-burial, co-resurrection, co-death, co-burial, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the sons of disobedience, in the which ye also once walked when ye lived in them. My friends, we can now set our affections. We can now seek those things which are above. And we can live our lives mortifying the deeds of the flesh and, and live a life um, that is heavenly high in Christ Jesus. You, for ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What a great comfort to know that we are those who have been made complete in the Godhead bodily.